Good evening, and thank you for joining us again for another virtual town hall. Uh, a lot has happened over the last 24 hours. As of today, we are at uh, 1,137 cases in Ohio with uh, 19 deaths in Ohio. Um, so a lot has happened. The, we're tracking with the model that Dr. Acton has presented in her town halls. And tonight, uh, Lisa Krieger, our member of council, We'll be speaking a bit more on that on the model. Uh, but tonight I have a couple other updates that I want to give you. The Ohio General Assembly has passed legislation to extend the tax filing and payments due for the state and municipal income taxes. This is to align with the federal policy of moving the filing dates from April 15 to July 15. Also, another important, important reminder that uh, related to the coronavirus, uh, the crisis. Uh, a lot of changes happen around voting. The new voting uh, processes have been put in place. So Ohio will continue voting uh, by mail through April 28th. So please don't lose your voice, uh, vote. For more information and to request a mail-in ballot, please visit the website, voteohio.gov. Now we're, we're also closely monitoring the stimulus package that is being done at the federal level and with, uh, with the state, we want to make sure that we are uh, well positioned to apply for any funding that will become available at the state and federal level so that we have the resources that we need to ensure an effective and proper recovery for the village. And with those announcements, I would like to turn it over to my colleagues, Lisa Krieger, uh, council member. Hi, thanks so much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'm Lisa Krieger, a member of the Village Council. And tonight I wanna speak about the importance of following the governor's order to shelter in place and to reinforce why some of the actions that we're taking in the village, such as limiting access to parking lots is critically important. I then wanna share a few points about plans for the next Village Council meeting that's scheduled for April 6th. As Josue said, just two weeks ago, just two weeks ago, on March 13th in Ohio, there were 280 cases of COVID diagnosed and zero deaths. And as of the governor's press conference today, we have 1,137 individuals diagnosed with COVID and 19 deaths. And we know that that number is drastically underestimated because of the lack of testing. This growth is an example of exponential growth. Exponential growth occurs when the greater in size you are, the faster you grow, which makes you even greater in size. Think of a snowball rolling down a hill. Viruses during pandemics demonstrate exponential growth. And flattening the curve are the actions that we can take to reduce this exponential growth. Individuals who have been diagnosed in Ohio range from age one to 96. And we really have to remember that this is not just a disease for the elderly. It's touching people from all generations, although certainly people who are older or who have other chronic health issues are more likely to experience the worst symptoms. But this is why it's so important that each of us as individuals do our part to stop the spread of the virus in our village, state, and beyond. The director of the Ohio Department of Health, Dr. Amy Acton, and I'm a huge fan, she's so wise and science-based, has shared this helpful visual that demonstrates the important and amazing impact that our actions already have had to flatten the curve of COVID impact. Josue, can people see that uh, visual now? Yes, we had it up as you were speaking. We're gonna put that up. Great, uh, thank you. So on the left side, you'll see that very steep spiky curve. And that is a demonstration of the daily new infections that would have been predicted had uh, we not taken the actions in Ohio to flatten the curve. Daily new infection rates of 40,000 and I mean, that's horrible for each individual, but the bigger impact is the impact on the healthcare delivery system who could not ever have provided care for that many persons. 
In contrast, the curve on the right, which you can see is much more flat and more smooth, that's an example of what we mean by flattening the curve. And this is the impact that we've already achieved in Ohio, thanks to everybody's actions, where the predicted peak um, due to mitigation that includes continued distancing um, is so much lower under 10,000. And this is much more doable for our healthcare systems to provide any care that you might need. So how do we keep doing this? Because it's not a one day thing. We have to keep maintaining the practices of sheltering in place, maintaining physical distance of at least six feet, practicing careful hygiene by keeping surfaces very clean, and thorough frequent hand washing. And I know I sound like a nurse right now because I am, but don't forget to sing that ABC song and keep washing with soap and water the whole time because yes, soap and water is all you need as long as you wash your hands long enough. I, I know that many of you are struggling right now with so many demands and so much unpredictability and yes, fear. I mean, life as we know it has been upended. And the decision to do things like limit access to village parking lots is another example of a disruption in life as we know it. And I understand that each decision, even if we understand intellectually that this is an action made to flatten the curve, is yet one more disruption of what we love about our village. So please just keep in mind as we weather this health crisis together, what Dr. Acton said, and that's the actions that we each take today, tomorrow, and in the days to come are not just for ourselves and our family, they're for our entire community and our state and beyond. Okay, just another minute shifting gears to a brief update about the next council meeting. Our next council meeting is Monday, April 6th at 7 p.m., and we will be meeting via technology and we're actively planning ways for you to provide your input. During this unprecedented time, we're making every effort to maintain the democratic process and to continue to engage you in our representative government. We plan to focus the agenda topics during virtual meetings to legislative finance and policy issues that absolutely demand our discussion and decision-making. I believe based on the COVID projections that we will continue to focus working within these restrictions into May as the peak impact is forecast for May 1st. The council members who attend this call shall provide more updates next week about the specifics of how you can provide your feedback during the council meeting during these times. And thank you so much for the time this evening. Lisa, thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Colin Altman, Fire Chief. Thank you, Josue. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. I love the background. Thank you. Miami Township Fire Chief Colin Altman coming to you live tonight from a small moon um, somewhere near Alderaan. I want to echo what Lisa said just a little bit. It is getting serious, people. So if you're not socially distancing, if you're not staying home, if you're not doing everything we tell you to, cover your cough, all that stuff, now is the time. 1,137 cases. That's a lot and it's gonna get bigger and bigger. So we need you to do the right thing and take this seriously. Just because some people aren't doesn't mean you shouldn't. So it's very important. Uh, I wanna make you all aware of some changes if you should have to call 911 for a medical emergency. Um, if you've called 911 in the last few years, you know you get, you get asked a lot of questions. Now they're gonna ask you even more questions. They're gonna ask you questions about, does anyone or do you have a fever? Has anyone been sick recently? Does anyone have a cough? These questions are important for us, for law enforcement, so that we know what we're getting into. Uh, and we're properly prepared when we show up to help you out. Um, the dispatcher may even ask you to go outside. The idea is to get you out of what could be an infected home if you are uh, potentially sick with, with COVID-19. If you can't go outside, we may not all come in. We have to try and protect our crews. So you may just have one or two of us come inside and everyone else is standing outside. Don't take it personally. 
It's not a comment on your housekeeping or anything else like that. Um, it's just a protection measure. Um, if you are sick or have been sick or have a cough, we're gonna come in with a mask, gloves, goggles, maybe a face shield, perhaps a gown when we finally get them in stock. Um, and again, nothing personal. We just have to protect ourselves, protect you, uh, protect your family and protect the hospital staff as well. We also may put a mask on you. Um, and this is again, just a protection to make sure that everyone is safe and everything's going well. I also wanna switch gears just quickly and talk about coping with some stress. There's a lot of stress coming from here. You know, Lisa Krieger just spoke about some of the, the science um, and then I just, you know, yelled at everyone to do the right thing. Uh, so it can get pretty stressful. So some easy steps to help you cope with stress uh, during uh, the COVID-19 situation. Number one, number one, decrease the time you spend on news and social media sites. They're just going to freak you out. Trust me, I spend too much time as it is. Um, get your info from reliable sources. I would say, uh, oh, I don't know, coronavirus.ohio.gov. Uh, or the CDC site, I would stay clear of um, political sites and that kind of thing. So you want your, your information from science. Uh, set a daily routine that includes activities that you enjoy or that you find relaxing. Uh, talk with trusted friends, family members, colleagues uh, about any distressing thoughts or feelings that you may be experiencing. Maintain a healthy diet, which is important, especially for me, but I'm not doing it, but I'll try. Proper sleep and regular physical activity within limits. And then don't resort to smoking, drinking alcohol, or using other substances to deal with your stress. They never help. It's true. You know it, they never help. As always, Miami Township Fire Rescue is here if you need us. Give us a call if it's an emergency, obviously, or non-emergency, give us a call, we'll just talk. You know, we'll help you through stuff. Um, our new motto for this whole, this COVID-19 thing is to be safe, be kind and be hopeful. We're gonna get through this together, all of us. Um, might take some time, but we'll get there. So be safe, be kind, be hopeful. Back to you, Josue. Colin, thank you so much. And now we will hear from Chief Brian Carlson. Chief. Thank you, Josue. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's Friday. And Josue wanted me to talk a little bit about um, the parking lots and, and the reasons that I've closed um, those. So I'd like to start by talking about a conversation I had this morning um, with Governor DeWine. The main priority is keeping people home, keeping people away from one another. We are looking at probably two weeks until the big surge um, to use the, their words and stay at home, what that means is stay at home with the exception of essential trips, things like medicine, food, healthcare, caring for loved ones, caring for others. Um, the problem that we have being such a beautiful uh, destination is, you know, we've we had a huge influx yesterday, the past two days with uh, folks coming from out of town in numbers, in vehicles, and enjoying the beautiful day. Um, it breaks my heart to have to close the parking lots down, but this will be our first step in trying to limit um, the number of people that are together in Yellow Springs at one time. Um, the parking lot closures may seem confusing, but it's really very simple. If you wanna exercise, take your dog for a walk, go out, jog, just don't drive and do it. Do it from your home. Um, Governor DeWine is doing an amazing job, um, but we all need to understand that the way this virus spreads is simply by travel, going from one area to another. If we can limit that and maybe get a, a, a grip on it, we, we will be able to lessen this curve as Lisa mentioned. Um, I'm so proud to be part of our amazing place and you know, just know that my priority is the safety and well-being of our community. I do want to uh, do a special shout out to the United Methodist Church and the Yellow Springs Community Foundation for the generous donations coming in. Officers have been uh, stocked with snack bags and meals that they are distributing uh, throughout their tours. 
Please remember to check on your neighbors. Don't forget to call us. We're here 24 seven and everyone stay safe. Back to you, Josue. Brian, thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Karen Wintrell, Yellow Springs Chamber of Commerce. Karen? Thanks, Josue. Um, I'm actually really excited. Um, this will be my first time talking to the community. I'd really like to speak especially to the business community. Um, today was a good day, though, uh, with Congress passing what is being called the CARES Act. I don't want to go into the acronym, but there are, I think most people have heard about the things that will help their, the individuals with the checks coming. But specifically for businesses, there, there are loans that will actually turn into grants if they are used for payroll, mortgage, or utilities. So I would say that almost every business could probably make use of that. Um, there are also um, tax, there is also tax relief for businesses, <clears throat> excuse me, that includes provisions like payroll tax deferral and the ability to immediately monetize tax losses. So that will be a big one also. And then there's another provision of money specifically for industries that have been particularly hard hit. Um, the two that impact us, or the three that impact Yellow Springs most are hotels, restaurants, and nonprofits. So there are certainly other provisions in the act, but those are the ones that I think are most important for businesses. Um, the chamber has been working really hard to get out the word about the local businesses that are still active. Um, that we can still support. Um, we have one list for restaurants that are doing delivery and carry out. And we have another for uh, retail, um, local retail of the essential businesses that people can walk into. Or also um, we have a lot of businesses that are doing online retail. So we really want people to support those businesses. Remember when you're going into a, a location, a retail location, that there may be a restriction on the number of people that can enter that location. Um, the SBA is a big source of funding also. There's some additional funding through their um, disaster loan fund. I am doing a webinar on Tuesday at one o'clock in the afternoon with uh, Alex Coles, who's with the SBA, and we're gonna be talking about the Disaster Loan Fund and also some of the new provisions that are coming out of the, the CARES Act. So um, if you're interested in that, um, I did send out a chamber newsletter this afternoon, or actually this evening, um, and there is a link in that to get to the webinar on Tuesday, but I'll also provide some more information. I'll be updating our Facebook page and website to add that. Um, in addition to, um, to, to loans, and, and the banks also, as far as loans are concerned, banks are also offering some great deals. So please talk to your lending institution. Um, the credit union, with support from the Community Foundation, is providing actually zero interest loans up to $1,500 that can be for individuals or businesses. Um, and, and I also expect that there's going to be more and more programs, um, more uh, deferrals of, of potentially tax payments and other things happening of, of rent, of mortgages and things as this continues. Um, there are just going to have to be more programs that are going to be able to assist our, our businesses. Um, let's see what else. Um, and, and I also wanted to say kind of along the lines of, of what Chief Carlson was just talking about and the, the groups of folks who are coming to Yellow Springs. Um, part of that I feel good about because I feel as if it's evidence of, of the, the great job the Chamber's been doing to um, talk about what a great place Yellow Springs is to visit. But um, now we've, we've completely turned course and we're working hard to get the message out that um, we'd love you to come to Yellow Springs, but please don't right now. So the, the message is honor the stay at home order, practice physical distancing, care for yourself and others and visit us when this is over. And this is a banner that's on our website, on our Facebook page, um, and a couple of different locations on our website and that we are going to continue to push out there. We're also going to make posters that we'll post around town uh, in various locations around town. So I think that's it, Hansway. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, next up, we have Bethany Gray with the Yellow Springs Community Food Pantry. Bethany, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of the pantry first for those that may not be um, familiar with what we do, what we do, what we have done up to this point. Um, and hopefully I'll give you a little background information. Um, I'm a board member of the food pantry along with um, Lisa Russell, Linda Chernick, and Paula Hurwitz, who is the director. And the food pantry has been around for several decades as a grassroots effort in this community. Um, however, in 2019, it did um, officially form its own 501c3 organization. Um, and it still operates out of the Methodist Church building. And um, the, that's where our address is as well at 202 South Winter Street. Um, Currently, um, we have we serve about 20 to 25 households twice a month. The pantry is open on the second and the fourth Thursdays of every month from 2 to 4 p.m. And those could a lot of those could be similar households, but there's always different households that are in need, and that totals about 70 unique households each year that are typically served by the food pantry. Um, and that includes some households in Clifton as well. Um, the pantry is not connected into a food bank organization because the community is um, able to support it on its own. Um, we do work with the Green County Health Department and we also um, uh, generally just accept donations, either monetary or food donations from the community to keep it operating. Um, we have also served um, Antioch College students, um, food, food and snack pantries at the Bryan Center, Mills Lawn Elementary School, and we also support the um, beloved community um, hot meal that they serve at the Presbyterian Church every month. Um, the pantry is based on residence, not on income. So we don't uh, verify the income when you attend. So anyone can come to use the food pantry if they have a need. Um, uh, if, if someone does show up that is not in Yellow Springs or Clifton, they will still be served. Um, but we will encourage them and give them information about the pantry in their community, whether it be Xenia or Fairborn or elsewhere. Um, on, the, on the fourth Thursdays of every month, the uh, pantry also distributes certain toiletry items, paper products, and laundry detergent. Um, so that's something that is given out uh, additionally in the month. Um, as I said, we typically serve 20 to 25 households. Now, obviously Antioch, Mills Lawn, and uh, Bryan Center are all uh, closed right now. Um, so what we are doing is we're currently, we started supporting the local school district families um, by packing up grocery bags of food. And um, we're doing that every week. And that's, we've packed about 60 bags last week a week and that may increase. And so um, we have needed an increase in food donations for that purpose. Um, this week, the pantry was open. The pantry still does um, want to remain open on the second and fourth Thursdays. However, the church building is closed and we are practicing distancing and we are um, providing pre-packed bags of food at the church entrance way. So it's a little different of a situation. You can't come into the pantry to shop as usual, but there will still be things provided at the church entrance on those days. Um, right now, there is an effort. There is always a bin at, there's always a bin at Tom's Market where people can drop individual food donations, non-perishables um, mostly. Um, but we are also doing a program Tuesdays and Wednesdays now um, with the help of the Community Foundation from 9 to 11.30 a.m. Um, you can drop off food donations of non-perishable items 
at um, the Methodist Church entrance, the porch area. So you won't come in the building, but you can drop donations there and they'll be processed. Um, we just ask that you don't donate any expired items or any opened items that have been utilized already. Um, there is another program that you can also take advantage of. It's called the Porch Program, and that is coordinated with uh, Libby Hammond, and they uh, do a pickup once every month. It's the first Monday of every month, and they will continue doing this. Uh, that is, so the next, the next Porch Pickup is um, Monday, April 6th, and um, to, you have to get on a list to do that where she will come, they will come to your house and pick up any food donations for the pantry that you have left on your porch. Um, and the list, I will give that email right now, um, is to contact Libby if you'd like to do this, is yellow springs at porchcommunities.org.org. Yellow springs at porchcommunities.org. And you can help us um, by leaving food on your porch for those days. Um, currently, we actually this week we we saw let we we actually served less people than usual. Um, there was some confusion out there because the the church is closed, um, and some people thought the pantry was also closed. So we don't know how that impacted the service this week, but we can still continued to serve about 12 to 15 families this week. So we haven't gotten um, an increase yet in the regular pantry hours, but we are preparing in case we do. Thank you. Bethany, thank you so much. Very useful information. And we're gonna post that email mm -hmm. and all the other content that you provided. Um, I wanna summarize my introduction points because We've heard from some of the viewers that they could not hear the first part of the video. So before we get to Mayor Pam to close out the session, I wanna cover some of my points and we'll cover the COVID modeling that, that Lisa Krieger um, presented on. So to highlight three points that I've made, um, the first one was regarding municipal income tax filings. The Ohio General Assembly passed legislation to align are filing dates and payments with that of the federal government, the IRS tax filing. So legislation has passed to uh, allow for filing and payment of your state and municipal taxes uh, to be moved from April 15th to July 15th. So you have some additional time. The second piece, and this is very important, that as you know, the voting, uh, voting was delayed. The General Assembly has put in a process to allow Ohioans to continue voting via mail until April 28th. So you still have some time to vote. Please vote, don't lose your voice. For more information and to request a mail-in ballot, please visit the website, voteohio.gov. And now I'll pass the, the mic to Lisa Krieger. And Lisa, when you tell us to, we'll put that image back up. Lisa, Lisa, I'm sorry, we don't we don't have sound coming from your mic. Hi, Josue. I just have a clarifying question. Were um were it, was it just the comments when the model was up, or all of my comments? The model. It was uh, okay. The great the model. So the second okay, part great. of the model was covered. Mm -hmm. All right. I won't be then repetitive, but please let me know when the model is up. Okay. Yes. It is up now and oh. I'm gonna share it here on my screen so that you also have it available. Great, thanks so much. So I just have found this model that uh, Dr. Amy Acton, the director of the Ohio Department of Public Health has shared. So you see on this two different curves, a very, very steep curve um, that is sort of orange in color. And what that points to is the, um, number of um, daily new infection rates that would have occurred if Ohio had not taken the very focused uh, actions to mitigate COVID spread. 
And so you can see how high that curve is, that the steep curve that's more orange rather than the lower curve that's blue. And what's really critical about that is not only that it indicates how many people would be ill and die, but there's also the impact on the healthcare system because this over a flattened curve, the same number of people might be ill, but because the curve is flattened, the healthcare system can care for you. And as a result, even though you were very ill, there would be enough ventilators and things like that to care for you. And so your likelihood of a, of a very bad outcome is minimized. So then that lower curve, um, this is the new projection based on the actions that you have already taken as individuals and that we have taken as a state in order to flatten the curve. So the, the news is this is great. We're doing exactly what we need to be doing, but we have to persist and we have to stick with the mitigating um, practices of sheltering in place and maintaining physical distancing. And maybe you heard me already talk about my silly ABC song. Um, I'm not sure what you did or did not hear, but you know, wash your hands, clean your surfaces, stay six feet apart. Um, so hopefully I've uh, covered what you couldn't hear. And if not, everything I said was absolutely uh, riveting. <laughs> I completely agree. I completely agree. I think, ah. uh, I think we're cut off at that point when you were transitioning out of the model. Thank you, Lisa, so much. And now we would uh, we'll give the mic over to Mayor Pam. Thank you, Josue. Good evening, villagers and those of you out in the township. I come to you tonight with a simple message. The 2020 census is underway. According to Article 1, Section 2 of our United States Constitution, taking census is done every 10 years and is a requirement of our federal government. Uh, in, in 2010, approximately 74% of our population returned the forms that the government had sent them and the other remaining 26% were interviewed by the, the census takers who walked around through the neighborhoods and would come to your house. This is the first year, 2020, that you are able to register your census questions online. So that's pretty exciting. Many of you probably got a letter like this in the mail which on the front says, your response is required by law. So this is a legal thing. When we opened it up, we found a sheet giving you your own private access to a very safe online connection with your own census ID number. When you went to that site, you were asked to fill out five or six questions about the number of people who live in your house and a few other uh, data points as well. Now, why is this important? Well, this information in the census, the 2020 census, is used to direct billions of dollars in federal funds to our local communities for schools, roads, and other public services. It also helps the community prepare to meet transportation and emergency readiness needs. No better example than right now why this is important. Determines the number of seats in each state that we will have in our US House of Representatives and our political representation in all levels of government. Now, this is due Mar um, April 1st. This is due April 1st, that's five days from now. If you, like me, laid this with your pile of bills and sort of got tied up in the last two weeks of other important things that were happening in the village, you might have gotten an envelope with a letter in it that uh, look like this, that basically said, um, Mayor Pam, you haven't filled out your form yet. So this gave you a second chance. If you don't reply online this time, they will mail you a paper questionnaire as per usual, and you can fill that out. And if you don't do that, they will send one of the little people around the, the information data collectors around to your house 
where they do the interview. Now these secondary two steps, these last two steps, waste valuable tax dollars, census funds and so forth. So I'm hoping that like me, if you kept this just laying there and haven't done it yet, that you can do that. So please don't forget they will not send the walkers around until the end of April. That has been pushed back because of the COVID issues. So that the, the interviewers won't come to your house till then. But if you have this form in your house, remember you have five more days to participate in a timely way in Census 2020. Now I'd like to turn things over to my friend and colleague with the Community Foundation, Kat Walter, who has some things to share too. Thank you, Josue. Thank you, Marpa. Hi, my name is Kat Walter and I'm the program manager at the Yellow Springs Community Foundation. And quite a few amazing volunteers in the community have helped us put together a household needs assessment survey that is now online. And Jose, um, do you have the information on the slide I sent you? Yes, we're putting it up now. Okay. Um, we ask that every household in the township and village in Miami Township and Yellow Springs fill this out, even if you don't have any needs right now, so that we know you don't, so that we have a record of that. It'll be confidential, but it will help organizations, volunteers around the village move forward with needs as the pandemic uh, increases and we are also finding other ways to have ongoing updates to that. Um, the address is www.yscf.org forward slash NBC dash survey forward slash and the neighborhood block contacts we have um, probably up to 50 of them who are covering every corner of the village and out into Miami Township. Um, you were emailed important information today about the first steps that you'll be taking contacting the households in your area. And um, you'll be uh, also provided hard copy surveys to hand out to people who are not able to go online to fill them out. And we'll have much more information about that, about that coming up very soon. Um, and I believe that you should have a color coded map included that somebody put together that you can give people a visual to show how we have blocked out these different areas with the contacts. This will be published in the paper as soon as this map is final. We'll have it on the website. So you'll be able to identify where you live with your neighborhood block contact. And that information will be provided to every household so that you will know who this person is. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. And we have that map up on the, on the video feed. And I will transition over to to the slide with the text so folks can get that that uh, web address that you mentioned and that to repeat that to the public that's www.yscf.org forward slash nbc dash survey forward slash thank you cat and now we will open up to questions we have a few questions that already come in and i want to remind our viewers that if you wish to submit a question please dial in or go to our YouTube or Facebook channels and you can submit your questions there. Uh, the phone number to call in your question is 937-767-3402. And we'll start with the first question. And this question is going to be for, for Karen and, and myself. So Karen, get your part ready. For those who are not from Yellow Springs, what is our community doing to help deter these visitors during this time? Um, I think our police chief Brian Carlson can jump in on this. We've um, we've tried to maintain all of our public spaces open. They're still open. What we're trying to do is limit uh, groups of people piling into a car and all meeting up in in central locations or recreational spaces um, because it's not adhering to the spirit of the stay home order and the guidance by CDC on physical distancing. Uh, Karen has put together some great content. Um, Karen, would you like to jump in on your efforts? You have an email uh, chain that's gone out to 6,000 people. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, yeah, we, we are not only is the chamber not actively sending out <clears throat> invitations to come to Yellow Springs, <coughs> we're sending out information um, on our Facebook page and in other ways, <clears throat> excuse me, 
that's telling people not to come to Yellow Springs. <clears throat> You're going to have to take over. Okay. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, we know we know that um, you know it's a li very difficult uh, decision to want to close public spaces or limit access to public spaces. We haven't closed those spaces yet, but it's important that we follow the guidelines of physical distancing and the spirit of the stay uh, stay home order. And this is to help flatten the curve and help protect each other. And having folks come come to the Yellow Springs or just go about anywhere that it's not um, following those guidelines around physical distancing and protecting each other. It's not, help, it's not gonna help us contain the spreading of this pandemic. Um, so we ask folks to be mindful of that. Um, we cannot police everyone. What we can do is limit access, and that's what we've done with, well, what uh, Police uh, Chief Brian Carlson has done with the parking lots. Um, so we hope that that contributes, uh, that that helps, um, but we also want to be supportive of our local businesses, um, the essential businesses. So we want to, we don't want to discourage anyone from using those businesses, and we're mindful of that. And Karen has done an amazing job of putting together infographics and. Uh, information on what businesses are doing, what their operation levels are, and how to access those businesses. So we still want to encourage folks to utilize those essential services. They're doing a lot for our community to feed us, to keep us warm, and all the wonderful things they're doing. So we'll continue to find, to look for the right balance of activities uh, to encourage the right behavior. Uh, Police Chief Carlson, is there anything you would like to add to that? Uh no, not really, Josue. I just want to reiterate to everyone that um, it's inspiring when we're out. I'm getting reports from uh, officers on patrol, seeing the, the kindness, um, people asking, are you okay? Is there anything we can get for you? Um, from our police side, uh, beginning Monday, officers on calls uh, at homes, even our welfare checks, um, they will be wearing per personal protective equipment. Don't be alarmed. It's just a protocol for us to keep you safe um, because of uh, the fact that we're out in the public all day. Um, but that's it. I hope everyone has a restful weekend. Um, this is, you know, March 27th of 2020. Um, Josue, thank you for being able to facilitate these meetings. Um, the word has gotten out to surrounding jurisdictions. They were asking me about them yesterday. And I think it's a great way for us to connect and get closer as a community while we maintain our physical distancing. Thanks everyone. Thank you, police chief. Now we have additional questions that come in and actually chief, this one's also for you. The question is how can the Yellow Springs community remain safe at night? Are we supposed to lock our doors, our cars, et cetera? That's a resounding yes. Um, lock your car doors if it's parked. Um, try to keep your porch lights on, uh, both front and back of the house. And uh, lock your, close your garage doors, lock your doors. Um, we're doing pretty well, folks, but you know, crimes of opportunity um, are the, the easy way. And so just by, you know, making things a little bit more secure and safe. It will keep uh, those that may try to do that type of thing um, moving on to another community. Um, so three things, lock your doors, keep your porch lights on, and contact the police department if you'd like us to come by the house and just do a drive-by or a welfare check. We're always here 24-7. Thank you, Chief. We have another question. I'm still not sure how to give to the pantry. Is there a drop-off point? How can I help? Bethany, I believe this question is for you. Okay. Um, well, normally under normal circumstances, you could take uh, food to the Methodist church when the office is open, but the Methodist church building is closed. So you can't do that right now. Um, for a small number of items, there is a drop bin in, there's a bin inside of Tom's grocery store that you can put 
um, small number of items in there. For any um, larger number of bags of items, um, I'll repeat, there, there's going to be a regular drop-off at the Methodist Church porch. Um, and that's going to be on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from nine o'clock to 11.30 in the morning a.m. And you can bring those items and put them on the porch and they will be processed. And that will start this Tuesday, uh, March 31st. So Tuesdays and Wednesday mornings. Um, and then the other option you can do is the, um, uh, once if you just have a donation, a food donation once in a while, that's the uh, porch program, which is the first Monday of every month. Um, but you have to get on a list to participate and that's when they will come and pick up food from your own porch that you leave. Um, and that I will, I will repeat that email if you'd like to get on that list. It is yellow springs at porchcommunities.org. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. And now we have additional questions. Okay, this one's for me. Are we operating from an endpoint or are we working day to day? Uh, not an easy question. And there's also not an easy answer to it. The, we have the, the model that Lisa presented on and the model has projects a peak uh, sometime around April 15th. And that's if we hold all of the activities we're doing, we expect to see a peak there. And then we see a downward swing or a downward trend on new cases, uh, but that's just a model. So in essence, we're working on this day to day, day to day, um, as, as this progresses, but we know that we're not close to hitting the peak. Um, Fire Chief Colin also referenced this on a number of cases. We anticipate that there's going to be a lot of cases. The Dr. Acton uh, today and yesterday uh, reminded us that at the peak, we could be looking at 8,000 cases per day. Um, so this is according to the model. So there's no, there's no specific endpoint um, working on this as uh, day to day um, as the situation is changing, but we know that we are uh, facing tough times ahead of us. Colin or Lisa, is there anything you would like to add to that? No, I mean, I think it's just important to stay the course. We're doing a good job in Ohio. Um, we just need to do uh, continue doing that good job um, and realize that things are going to get worse, unfortunately. Um, but by doing everything Lisa talked about and Dr. Acton talked about, we can keep that curve flat and uh, try and mitigate as much of this as we can. So just keep on doing it. Thank you, Colin. And, you know, we've talked about several times, we talked about preparing for the long haul. This is a marathon, not a sprint. So we have to plan for, for a long run. Okay, next question. How are we partnering with the police department during the new good weather that we are experiencing? It seems that the best weather yields more people. Are we prepared? Chief, this one's for you. Uh, we're prepared as best we can. We're uh, staffing two officers on at all times. Um, we do have a mutual aid agreement with our surrounding jurisdictions. Should one department, um, uh, you know, a few officers end up out because they're ill, we'll be there to support the uh, departments in our close proximity. Um, we have stepped up. Patrol officers are staying in vehicles. I'd rather have them in their vehicles rather than uh, so much time on foot. So you'll see the cars buzzing around a little more than normal. Um, we also have the obligation to protect our, um, our businesses in town that are closed. So we're, we're around and um, we're just, as Josue said, kind of taking it day by day. As we engage people that are in town, we're still doing our usual friendly 
um, reminders and such. And we found that most people um, oblige and and listen to the to our words. We do have a, a large group of younger people coming into town, but in closing the basketball court, um, that that's helping us as well. Um, so I still urge people to, you know, if you're home and bored or you just want to get out in the sunshine, take a walk, go for a jog, um, take your pet for a walk, but just stay out of your vehicles. Um, strictly use those for emergency or essential trips. I'd like to make a quick comment on the closing of the basketball court. Um, part of the uh, governor's order included uh, closing uh, playgrounds. And it's true that perhaps when you play basketball, you could maintain physical distancing, but you're passing a ball around. So, I mean, I would equate uh, the basketball court to be a playground in that way and to be at high risk for infection transmission. So I, I think that was the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question. Bethany, I think this one, this one um, would be for you. Please explain the porch communities and they've included a link porchcommunities.org. It looks like it's from North Carolina. Is this good for a community as well? Um, yes, the porch program is actually a um, national program that was started and based out of North Carolina. And um, Libby Hammond here in town heard about it when she visited North Carolina. She came back to town and worked with the food pantry to organize um, the program here. And essentially it involves um, a pickup program um, where uh, it, it, you do have to get onto a list to participate so they know where to pick up food. But it has, um, it has been operating for the local Yellow Springs Food Pantry since 2018. And they bring in a lot of um, food donations every month that are significant to the pantry. Another benefit of the porch program is they can send you a list every month of what we need that month of what we might be low on. So if we're low on canned beans or cereal, then you can also get that list in advance if you want to help provide those particular items. Um, so it has been operating um, almost two years and it is a national program. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Next one is for police chief. Can the police chief speak to the break-ins in our community and what should we do? Um, if, I, I believe you might be referring to the hyperreach that I put out the other day about vehicles being locked. So what we're seeing is um, throughout the middle of the night sporadically, um, we believe that there are vehicles that pass through town. Uh, several people get out of the vehicles and simply walk down the street quietly and discreetly and check vehicle doors to see if they're unlocked. We haven't had one vehicle entered that was locked. Um, most of the reports, we've had six um, within the last two weeks, uh, people talking about their vehicle being rummaged through. Um, I don't know if there was property that was reported stolen or not from these, but if you remember about a year ago, we went through this as well. Um, we did end up uh, finding the, the group that was doing this, but this is a common thing. Um, so that's, you know, for me, that's the reason I'm urging folks to lock their doors and, and keep their porch lights on. We don't find uh, a physical threat in any way, but you never know. And I would say it's better to be safe. That's why these messages are coming out, folks. Thank you, Chief. This next question is for Mayor Pam. Regarding the census, how can we do our part? You can best do your part by filling out the form and participating. You're counted. You're counted for your community 
And, and, and that's it, that it's that simple. This data is very important and it results in major decision-making. It's the basis for decisions that are made, again, for our representation and disbursement of funds and so forth. So you can help by doing it. Get that sheet out, go online to United States, 20, my2020census.gov my2020census.gov, 2020census.gov. You will need your special code number, which if you still have your, your sheet, will be provided for you. I believe there's ways you can enter if you no longer have that information. But that's a simple one to answer. Just participate. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. We have additional questions that have come in through Facebook. The first question is regarding the weather advisory. Um, could we make an announcement about the bad weather tomorrow, potentially tornadoes for the whole day? Uh, so be advised that the National Weather Serv Service uh, is predicting hazardous weather conditions for tomorrow. And this, air, this hazardous weather advisory is for East Central Indiana, South Indiana, C Central Ohio, Southwest Ohio, and West Central Ohio. So beginning tomorrow afternoon, um, we expect a, I'm sorry, beginning today, tonight, low probability of widespread hazard, uh, hazardous uh, weather. Uh, day two through day seven, that which is Saturday through Thursday, we expect thunderstorms, um, specifically Saturday night. Some of these storms may be severe with a primary threat of damaging winds, wind gusts, of 40 to 50 miles an hour are possible on Sunday. And that's your weather advisory for today. The second question, this is related to digital signs and billboards. The question is, could we use, could we post electric billboards like the ones we do for street fair? We are, we started to look into this. Karen made a connection for us earlier today and we're following up, um, we're looking to, place these digital signs regarding closures in our community. Um, we'll continue working through it through the weekend on this and hope to have a resolution next week. We have another question. Uh, are Yellow Springs police dispersing groups of people congregating in town or shutting down those who continue to operate non-essential businesses? How many warnings or citations have been given? Chief? Thanks, so, Oswe. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. So what we're doing is following the governor's order. Um, if we find uh, someone that might be operating and there's, it's questionable, um, we're kind of doing it our way where we, we have conversations with them, um, so a verbal. And then if we uh, don't see compliance on our next visit, then we will do a written warning. And then um, third, we will issue this citation and they will be, um, uh, we will forward that information to the Attorney General's office and the Department of Public Health. Um, we haven't reached that point. Everyone's been very accommodating. I think early on there were a few questions about whether or not uh, my business was considered essential. Um, so we've been in good shape there. Regarding dispersing crowds, We've been strictly talking with people, um, kind of giving them information about how to stay safe and remain safe. We have not issued any tickets at this point on folks coming into town. Um, the next step is what we've done, which is you know kind of close off the available parking. And I think we're slowly stepping into um, the next phase, which we may see more citations written. At this point though, everything's been verbal and written warnings. Thank you, Chief. And now we have another question through YouTube. What is the village doing about the price of utilities during this crisis? Um, early on, we made the decision to suspend all disconnect uh, actions. Uh, we didn't need the state to ask us to do that or, or very folk, we, we took the decision upon ourselves. We knew that it was an important way to alleviate the burden in our community during this crisis. So we did that decision early on, suspended, disconnect, 
activities, we're also waiving late fees for our customers. And those are two concrete steps that we take in to alleviate the burden for our community. We understand that it's tough times now and tough times ahead, and we're gonna do all that we can to work with the residents uh, to ensure that their services stay on, while also ensuring that we are running an efficient business for our, all of our ratepayers, all of our customers. Uh, so st stay tuned, that's a continued work in progress, but we're doing all, all that we can to support our residents. I have um, one last question we'll take for, for tonight. I've heard that Green County Jail has reduced the inmate population by 40% over the past two weeks. What are our local police doing to prevent new inmates from entering the jails? Chief? Um, we haven't had a jail arrest in the last two weeks. Um, we're trying to work with um, directives from the governor's office, the AG and uh, Sheriff Fisher. We haven't, we've, we've actually seen a decrease in calls for service and crime, which is a good thing. I do think that um, everyone needs to prepare for the next few weeks because as, as we reach that peak, which hopefully will be at the, the lower curve, um, we will be very, very busy. Our primary focus, again, is the safety and well-being of the community. So that's where we are at this point. We're working with other agencies as well. Um, again, right now we're, we're seeing a lower call for service, particularly regarding crime. Um, theft is where it typically is. So we're also monitoring that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. And with that, we would like to close out our virtual town hall. If you uh, didn't get your question answered, we will follow up. We will write the, the response and send that out. Um, and we'll also encourage you to tune into the next virtual town hall. I would remind all of our neighbors or friends or residents that this crisis is testing us. It will test all of us, but we are certain that as a community, practicing this shared leadership and collaborative model that you're seeing here, we will get through this and we will do so together, while also ensuring access to essential services, food, shelter, and a safety net. Uh, we look forward, forward to partnering with you in this endeavor as this requires the participation of the entire village and township. And with that, I would like to say good night. Be safe, have a good weekend.